brothers and sisters, friends and guests, please have a seat. I've got two really important things to talk about that I'm pumped to talk about in addition to our sermon before we jump into today's content. The first important thing is, I hope you like my pants. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, do you ever put something on and you look in the mirror and you say, this was a bad idea, but I don't have time to change, so let's roll with it. No, it was, it was fun this morning, and uh, my wife bought me these pants, so I felt confident that if she got them for me, that she wasn't trying to, you know, joke with me or, or <laughs> make me feel bad. So, you know, there you go. That really wasn't that important, obviously. The second thing that's much more important, uh, this, this week, I got to go to Denver, Colorado with a team of some folks here from the church to an Acts 29 conference. Man, it was so good. It was so encouraging. If you're new here, still feeling us out as a church, we're a part of a network called Acts 29. And where the network is right now and where it's going is so radically encouraging. If, if you're tuned in to like wider evangelicalism in our country, or if you listen to podcasts, if you've heard like the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast about a guy named Mark Driscoll, who used to lead Acts 29, man, like any denomination or church planting network, in those early days of who we were, God did a lot of really good stuff, but there was also a lot of leadership issues in the network. And by God's grace, we have worked through just a healthy season. And being in Denver with about 14 or 1,500 other pastors, church leaders all over the world, and seeing what God has been doing is radically encouraging. I just wanted to, I wanted to emphasize a bit of this because in our cultural context here in America, sometimes churches try too hard to like emphasize their uniqueness among other churches. But when you spend time with the global church, no one talks about their uniqueness. They talk about what they have in common because they're so surrounded by darkness and a lack of other believers. In the global church, no one cares about like uniquely, how do you guys do music? They're like, you're a believer? Like you believe in Jesus? You have hope in the midst of suffering and you, you can hold on to something that like pushes you into healthy relationships? I need that. Like, Global Christians, they just embrace each other, and it's really beautiful. So just a few exciting things. Acts 29 is now doing work in planting churches in 51 different countries, 51 countries. And there's uh, Acts 29 has something called Church in Hard Places and the Rural Church uh, Program. And so we as a church, every year, 2% of what you give, we give to Acts 29, and they use that to plant churches all over the world. And then in addition to that 2%, we give more money to church planting and missions and, and things like that. And so three quick stories of people that we met while you we were there. Um, Dave Melgren was one of the guys who came with us to this conference as the, the leader of the missions team. We met a guy named Facundo who's planting a church in Uruguay. And Uruguay is in Latin America. And Latin America is pretty Christian. It's mostly Catholic for the most part. But Uruguay has been settled by lots of Europeans. It has the second highest number of atheists per capita, second only to Europe in Latin America. And the closest gospel-centered church to Facundo is in Colombia, country of Colombia. And so he was telling Dave and I about how some folks have come to faith. There's about 40 people in his church, and it's all bottlenecked because he's, trying, he's the only person who, like, understands Christian orthodoxy. And he says on Sunday mornings they'll go to their church, and there's, like, chicken heads stabbed on, you know, forks and all this stuff. Because, like, the local, like, folk religions are trying to drive out, like, the bad spirits of Christianity because they don't know what Christianity even is. And uh, so Dave and I were talking and dreaming about taking a team to Uruguay because Dave speaks great Spanish. Not because of his gifts, but because of his wife, Lady. His wife, Lady, gets the credit for that. <laughs> but bringing a team down to Uruguay, serving Facundo, helping them raise up new planters, um, that was an exciting story. Then we met Francisco, 
So Francisco is another regional director that I get to work with. And he oversees all of South America, which is quite a bit if you haven't seen a globe in a while. And there's like 100 Acts 29 churches. This next year, they're assessing and planting 150 more churches. And it's just growing. And the Lord's doing work. And we're working on planting churches worldwide and bringing the gospel to all cultures. Last story, and this one is here in the States. I got to stay up late and talk with a guy named Elliot. And really cool dude. He's just a few years younger than me. He's married. He's got a young son. Elliot is planting a church in New Hampshire. Now, if you have spent much time in New England, you'll recognize culturally that's a really different place from here. And from a standpoint of Christianity, like a big church in places like New Hampshire, Mass, a big gospel center church is like 90 people. Because it's, it is, it's hard ground to stand firmly on the Bible and teach the ways of Jesus for all things. Not picking and choosing, but like preaching the Bible. In New England, man, you'll get a lot of people that'll cast stairs or worse, right? And so he's been working on planning a church for like a year. And his current core team is six people. And he was sharing with me just like how discouraged and tough it's been to be sharing the gospel and preaching and teaching and loving people. And you've got six people. And we hung out and we prayed together and encouraged each other. And, and it was just so good to connect with believers and pastors from all over the world. And so what I wanted you to hear as a believer is, like here in the States, it's just so common to hear churches identify sort of their uniquenesses, right? Like we've got this going with our kids program and we do this with our music and this is the thing that we're doing, but going that direction just isn't wise or healthy. Like that's great that we as a local church would be passionate about the specific things the Lord is doing here, but way better than that is the global connection we have with other believers who love Jesus. And in most of the world, People are pumped just to meet another Christian. They're just pumped to meet another Christian. So, man, treasure this community. Treasure being in the local church. Getting to serve one another, love one another, and be together. It was, it was such a good time. And just wanted to tell you a bit about Acts 29 and, and why we're so pumped about being a part of that network. So, friends, we're doing a series right now on the church. What is the church? Why the church? How do we interact with one another as the church? And we're doing that through the lens of four major metaphors that we get in the New Testament. Home, body, temple, and bride. Right now, we're in the metaphor of church as a body. And we're in the third week of that metaphor. So next week, we're going to jump into our third metaphor, which is the temple. The church as a temple. And we would love for you to join us for that. So come back next Sunday as we continue tracking with this series in the church. For today's content, we're talking about equipping. The church is equipped. Before we get there, let me do what I've done every Sunday and back out a bit and give you the wider context for this metaphor. Okay, so the human body has many different parts. And all those parts have a different function. So the body is united. It's, it's drawn together, but it's not uniform. United, but not uniform. And so we talked about in week one of this metaphor two weeks ago, we don't compare our body parts, apples, apple, apples to apples, to one another because they all have a different function. Your hands and your feet, your eyes and your ears, your nose and your mouth, they're all a part of the body, but they all have a different function. And so we must work together and learn how to function with the gifting the Lord has given us. Secondly, which we hit on last week, we don't function independently, but we function in relationship with each other. So we saw last week in 1 Corinthians 12 when Paul said things like, every member suffers together and every member rejoices together. Why? Because we're drawn together in relationship. That's how the Lord has designed the church. Finally, and this is today's content, 
The body learns how to do really complex things by being equipped. So we call it muscle memory. You do the same task over and over, like shooting a basketball, throwing a football, swinging a golf club, typing on a computer. Over months and months and years of training, your body is able to just do these complex things without even thinking about it. And that's because each individual part of the body is working together to do it. And so what's fascinating is, it's not like the head trains the body, right? The body trains the body. The whole body is engaged in training the whole body. So in the same way, each Christian in a local church is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and we receive gifts from the Spirit. That gives us our function. And then we're in relationship with one another, using those gifts together in a way that builds up the body, cares for one another, reaches out into the culture, and finally, we're all being equipped to do complex things together. All of us working together. So for today, the points are up on the screen. Here's today's points. What are the steps toward being equipped? We're all supposed to be equipped toward making disciples of Jesus. How do we get there? How does that happen? The three points are filling up, growing up, and building up. Filling up, growing up, and building up is how we are equipped. So Phil so kindly read our focus scripture this morning. Ephesians 4, 7 through 11 is where we see this idea of step one of being equipped that we've all got to be filled up. Let me read Ephesians 4, 7 through 11 again for us while it's on the screen. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. But what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So, the beginning of this passage is kind of odd. He takes the captives captive. He descends. He ascends. This sort of odd language. What in the world is this talking about? Well, there's a quote here from Psalm 68 in the Old Testament. And if you go to Psalm 68, which we're not going to this morning, David, who wrote this psalm, draws on the idea of an ancient king who wins a battle. And here's how things worked in the ancient world. Okay, so a king goes to war, brings an army. If the king is victorious, he takes all of the wisest of this empire that he's conquered, the strongest, the most intelligent, and he takes their most expensive stuff. And then the king sets up this huge train of captives and possessions. And then the king marches back into the city that he came from and all the people of this city line the streets and they celebrate the power of this king who's conquered this empire and brought back these people and these possessions and the king goes and sits on his throne. What Paul is doing here, he's using this idea of an ancient king conquering to connect it to Jesus. And it's really beautiful. The image is that Jesus descends from heaven. Just like a king descends his throne to go to war, Jesus descends from heaven, takes on flesh, and is going to war with the devil. Tempted in the wilderness, casting out demons, preaching and teaching and loving people. And not through battle, but through his death on the cross, Jesus ransoms people to himself. He wins people to himself. And then instead of the king going back to his throne, Jesus is now marching through all the churches that are celebrating him. And these captives that Jesus has taken, he's giving to churches as leaders. He's taking people out of the domain of darkness and using their gifts for the church. That's why Paul connects here in verse 11 
He says he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Where do these people come from? Any of you who are Christians here who can use your gifts to serve the church, where did you come from? Well, we all came from the domain of darkness. We're all created in God's image, but we're born into sin. Jesus comes to save. He ransoms us, and then he gives us as gifts to the church to serve and to love and to care for people. The key word here, or the key phrase, is the end of verse 10. Let me read verse 10 again. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. So, first step in being equipped is pretty simple. You have to be filled by Christ. Jesus fills all things. He's the one who brings the power. Jesus is the one who equips, trains, teaches, loves, moves. It's all Jesus who does that. And this is both challenging for us and encouraging. And let me just tell you why. You all know this intuitively about yourself already. Why is this challenging? This is really challenging because, do you remember that place in 2 Corinthians where Paul says this? Paul says, his power is made perfect in my weakness. You know where Paul says that? So, as an example, how do we apply this? In my own life, there's been times where like, I've thought to myself, I'm really gonna invest myself here to help this person or to make a difference over here, and it feels like there's no fruit. And then like two years later, some person who I didn't even know I was making an impact on will reach out and say something like, man, when you were preaching that one time and you talked about how bad you were at X, Y, Z and how you were trusting God for it, that really ministered to me. That's interesting. So like when I'm trying to use my strengths to lean in to make a difference, I feel like nothing's happening. And this random person over here I wasn't even trying to minister to is ministered to through my weakness. And so the challenge is, if it's Christ that fills ministry, if it's Christ that fills your marriage, if it's Christ that fills your friendships and your vocation, if it's Christ that fills you up to fight against your sin, that means it's not you. And so how do you get rid of you and get more of Christ? Well, John the Baptist showed us, he must increase and I must decrease. I must decrease. So if it's Christ that's filling all things, it's him filling me and not me filling me. And the only way that me doesn't fill me is when I put me on the cross. And when I bear and accept and give my weakness to the Lord and walk in honest vulnerability before others. That's the challenge. The encouragement is this. You don't have to be something special. The best things about you aren't really about you. And that's really encouraging to me. The best things about you aren't really about you. They come from the Lord. So that's point one. If we want to be equipped, just like how kings would go and and conquer and bring a train of captives, Jesus has conquered the devil and sin and Satan, and he's taken you as a captive, and he's given you to your local church to serve and to love, And he fills you as you're emptied of you and filled of him. He fills you for ministry in the church, in your home, in your workplace, anywhere you are. That's number one. Number two is growing up, filling up and then growing up. This is in Ephesians 4, 12 through 15. I'm going to start back at 11, though, because 12 is like mid-sentence. So starting in verse 11, and he himself Gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, 
Christ. Okay, so friends, if we want to be equipped to effectively build each other up, we can't just be filled up, but we also have to grow up. The filling up piece is all by Christ. That is purely by the work of Christ. We just submit and believe in the power of the gospel, the cross, and the resurrection. And just like John the Baptist teaches, we decrease and he increases. We're filled by Christ. But the growing up piece we're involved in. We're involved in this growing up piece. And how I want to handle this section of the passage is to kind of ask a succession of questions to help understand Paul's logic here on this idea of why we need to be grown up. So in verse 12, we see something that, like this verse has been so moving to me as a pastor, and it's, it's all I want in ministry. It is all I want. Verse 12, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Man, there have been so many pastors in the last 25 years that have blown up their lives, or their marriages, or their churches, because they seek a vision of ministry in which all of the credit and the work and whatever else terminates on them. And unfortunately, it grows big churches in our culture because there's just something about that celebrity culture in our context, right? Of like, man, this person's got it all figured out. You know, they read all these books and they're so smart and they're such great leaders. And I just, you know, there's like, even some churches grow because there's so much distance from the pastor. Like, wow, I'll go to this church because this pastor is amazing. I can't even talk to him. That's how amazing he is. I'm so distant from him. Like he's so great. That's not biblical, but it's common in our culture. It's really common in our culture. But what Paul gives here is a church that's all being equipped so that everyone's spiritual gifts are equally needed, equally valued. The church is being equipped to build up the body together. So we'll ask our first question based on verse 12. Why do Christians need to be equipped? Verse 12 tells us the answer. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. If you're not equipped, you can't build. And the vision of the New Testament is, all of us are building the church together. Not in our own power. We already talked about that in point one. Christ fills you up. He gives you the gifts. But we're all building up together. Okay, so next question. Why does the body of Christ need to be built up? We need to be equipped to build up But why does the church need built up? Paul gives us this answer in verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Okay, two specific pieces. Why does this church, for example, need built up? Why do we need to be equipped so that we can build each other up? We need to build each other up because, number one, we have to fight for unity in our faith. We need unity in our faith. Why do we need that? I'll tell you why you need that. Because maybe this morning your faith feels really stable. Some mornings my faith feels so stable. Not just mornings, also afternoons and evenings, right? Some days my faith feels stable. Like, I can sort of feel like no matter what happens to me or my family, I am with it, with Jesus. That's how Peter felt. Remember at the Last Supper, what did Peter say? Jesus said, Peter, man, he probably said that in Aramaic, man, because they're brothers. Listen, bro, before the rooster crows, Three times in a row, you're going to tell people that you don't even know me. I love you, Peter, but you're going to do this. What did Peter say? Jesus. No, I'm not. I will go to you to prison and even death. Peter says that. Who do you think was right? Whose prediction do you think came true? 
sweet little Peter or the son of God? It was, it was the son of God. Why do we need unity in the faith? Because hard things are going to happen to you. Things are going to happen to you that you don't choose, that you don't want, and it's going to shake your faith. And if you can't come to a local church and find unity in faith in the gospel, you're going to be sunk. Because you're going to have brothers and sisters who aren't going through a hard time who can say, stick it out. Keep praying. I love you. Let's go get ice cream. Let's go watch a movie. Let's go play pickleball. Let's do something together just to love you in this hard season. A church has got to be built up so that we can have unity in our faith. And friends, it's not just stuff that happens to you. Sometimes it's sin that gets into your own life and it's your fault. You know what you need? The grace of Jesus Christ. To repent of that sin, but to receive forgiveness for it. Right? And sometimes we get jammed up because everybody else can get God's forgiveness, but I can't. I can't have that. Why can't you have that? You're not any better than Peter. Peter is better than you. He took, he took Christ's forgiveness. He took Christ's forgiveness on that shore. You take it too. But sometimes we feel like we can't take it. We need unity in the faith of brothers and sisters that call us back to Jesus. We need that. Secondly, this is still part of one. So this is one B, whatever you want to write that on your notes, you know, for that. He doesn't just say unity in the faith. He says unity in the knowledge of God's son. So these are connected. How do we have unity in the faith? We're not going to have unity in the faith unless we're in the word and we're learning about who Jesus really is and who Jesus really isn't. And as a church, if we want to be built up, we have to have unity in what we believe about Jesus. This is, for example, from a pastoral perspective, this is why. So here's something our culture says. Most of the world is going to say this. Hey, listen, believe in Jesus. That's fine. Okay, take your Jesus. Go to church. Read your Bible. I don't care. That's fine. Whoa, whoa, but wait. The moment you take your Jesus and you start talking about how you do marriage based on what Jesus said, that's too far. Or where you take your Jesus and say that everyone has to have a heart of forgiveness. And that Jesus says that you can't be forgiven unless you fight to walk in forgiveness. That's too much. You know? And we could list many other issues. And what our culture wants to do is to just have like a very spiritualized Jesus without that filtering down into the practical realities of how we live nine to five or any other time of the week. And if we don't have unity in the knowledge of God's son, it is so unloving and so unhelpful if like unbelievers who want to know Jesus spend time in our midst and they get a different version of Jesus from everybody in the church. You know, you just sort of believe in Jesus. Oh man, I'm struggling in this hard and vulnerable place in my life. I need help. And if three different Christians give them a whole different version of Jesus, that is not loving. That is not helpful. That doesn't build up the church. So we have to have unity in the faith through unity in the knowledge of God's son. And the second piece of that is, after the comma in verse 13, Growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. We have to grow in deeper maturity. Okay, next question. So another set of questions. So we asked, we need to be equipped. Why? So we can build up the body of Christ. Why do we have to build up the body of Christ? So we can have unity and faith and knowledge and be more, more mature. Okay, next question. Why do we need to be more mature? Why do we need spiritual maturity? Verse 14. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. Friends, you and I need more maturity, Paul says, for two reasons. He talks about cultural pressures. That's what he means when he says tossed 
by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. So in one sense, the Bible tells you to have childlike faith, be like a child. But what Jesus means is have an open, receptive, vulnerable, ready heart that embraces God as father, just like my five-year-old son runs up to me and embraces me when I get home from work. Have a childlike faith, open to the father like that. But this is a different understanding of childishness. Paul says, we want to no longer be like children. What does he mean? He means that if, when we lack maturity, we don't really have a place that we stand firmly and we can just be blown about by hard times in life, by cultural trends, by what our neighbor thinks, what our parents think. Some person, maybe we want the approval of what they think. Paul says we need maturity so that we're not tossed around by waves and every wind. But he adds another piece. It's not just cultural pressures. He says it's also persuasive false teachers. Because he says, tossed around by waves, blown by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. That there are people that are employing techniques of deceit, not from the Lord, drawing us into false things about who he is. So Paul says, you have to be mature so that when these winds come, you don't get blown about. You have to be mature. So even if the teacher seems like they're so persuasive, but something seems off, we have to be able to read what that is. Stay stable and steadfast. When I was talking to um, the foreign believers at Acts 29, Brazil is a place where there is an enormous amount of church planting going on right now. I mean, it's unbelievable how much the Lord is doing in Brazil. But one of the hardest things that's happening is the prosperity gospel is just surging in Brazil. What's the prosperity gospel? A false teacher comes into town. Oh, and he shares such good stories and he cries and he's so moving and he preaches the word almost. And he talks about how you can trust in Christ for all things almost. And then he says, and if you give all your money to my ministry, who knows what kind of wealth will come your way? Who knows what kind of money you'll make if you give me all your money? And these false teachers come in and they fleece the poor of everything and they leave. That's called the prosperity gospel. It's a false gospel. It's not the real gospel, right? Because the treasure of Jesus is Jesus. The treasure of Jesus is not worldly comfort. And sometimes God gives us worldly comfort, praise God. But then we use that worldly comfort for the kingdom. <laughs> we enjoy it. We're thankful for creation, but we don't live for that. So that's an example here of why we need to be mature so we can ferret out false teachings, false gospels. That's why we need to be mature in the faith. Finally, this puts it all together in verse 15 for point two. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. Now, I love verse 15 here. We could, we could just spend like eight weeks on verse 15. What is it that makes us different from the rest of the world? In terms of how we approach people. The answer is verse 15. If we're walking in Christ, we aim to speak the truth in love. Now that's really simple. You've probably heard that, right? A million times. But let's just take a moment and apply this. I can think about with my own children, with my wife, with people close to me, how helpful this is and how much we need to remember this. If you make a practice of just speaking a lot of truth, but you don't do the work of generating through the help of the Spirit in prayer a deep love for other people, you're going to do some damage. There are lots of people in the world 
that are willing to speak truth all the time. A lot of them seemingly end up being political commentators, it seems, right? <laughs> They've sort of built a platform on just telling you how it is. And some of the things they're saying is true. That's great. But the world deals in truth without love, not believers. The world deals in that. That's what the world deals in. Truth without love. That does not build up the body of Christ. Now, on the other hand, the other error is to generate great feelings of love and then to not speak truth. You know, the, the classic phrase about that is, have you talked to that person? I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. I'll just pray more about it, and then I'll pray more about it. We have to speak truth in love. And that's what sets us apart from these wind and waves that blow of false teaching and, and, and deceit and cunning is fighting to be brothers and sisters who deal in truth with a spirit of deep, committed love. That's how we grow up. How do I grow up in my faith? When brothers and sisters speak the truth in love to me. How do you grow up? When people speak the truth in love to you. That's how you grow up. So we can be built up. So we can equip the body of Christ. Finally, third point is building up. Filling up. Growing up, now building up. Ephesians 4, 16. Paul puts everything together we've talked about into one verse. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. If you want a clinic on how this works, you can schedule Evan Reiner. He was one of our elders and a physical therapist. And over the years, I've talked to Evan about what he does and how he serves people. And once people get surgery, they spend time with Evan. And Evan manipulates their body in various places whether or not they want to. Evan's a big man. He can make them move their arms if, if they don't want to. You know, I don't want to do that workout. Well, you paid me. You're doing that workout. And Evan moves them around and gives them these workouts. And then they have to go home and they have to do them over and over and over and over to strengthen the joints and the ligaments and the muscles because it's the whole system that needs to be strengthened. And how does that happen? By each part working together to strengthen it. That's the metaphor Paul gives us here. Every ligament, every part working together to be equipped. So I love in verse 16, the first two words, Paul says, from him. He's talking about Jesus. That goes back to point one, filling up. It's Jesus who fills us up. This is all from him. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament. May connect from last week, where Paul says that God arranges the body how he sees fit. Each part brought together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body. There's the growing up. It promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love. How? By the proper working of each individual part. We have to grow up. We have to be filled up by Christ. We work together and we equip the church. Friends, it is all from Jesus, by Jesus, in Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus that this happens. It's for him, in him, through him, by him. And friends, as we live this way, as we fight to embody this metaphor of the body, we are equipped to be the church. So I just want to encourage you with just a, a simple vision of something to, uh, to process and think about as we turn to prayer uh, and communion. There's been several places and points in my life throughout ministry where I have really needed brothers and sisters to help me, to love me, to walk with me. I'm sure you've needed that as well. And what we're called to in this passage is to so long to be a church where people can come in 
and experience the power of being equipped. Not by one pastor, not even by two pastors, not by a few leaders, but the whole church engaged in equipping. Man, that lights my soul up. That's something that lasts far beyond me. That's something like if I go out here on 18th Street and get ran over. That's something that carries beyond me and beyond any pastor or any leader. And that's what we're called to. So friends, are you being filled up by Christ? Are you aiming to grow up? Because you're being called to build up. And we need that together. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for the rich images that you give us in your word that instruct us and teach us in ways that we could not receive if it was something more dense or intellectual. Father God, I pray for each person here this morning and everyone joining us online. Lord, if we're in a season of not being filled up well by you because there's other things that are in the way, God, would you do that work of helping us stand in the shoes of John the Baptist and just to pray a simple prayer of, Lord, help me decrease so you can increase. And Lord, if there's some of us here that aren't leaning into growing up toward maturity. God, not fighting for unity in the faith, unity in the knowledge of the Son, so we can be matured together and speak the truth in love. God, would you help us do that? Lord, maybe this morning, there's someone you're working on, or several people you're working on, in this idea of speaking the truth in love. Lord, would you give them courage, patience, joy, endurance to lean into that. God, we, we cry out to you, help us be a church that equips. God, help us to be a people where it's not on any one of us, but it's collectively on all of us together to build up this body for your glory, Lord. We're so thankful for the global church. We are so thankful for brothers and sisters who hours ago or hours later, as the sun moves around the globe, that in 51 countries, there will be churches that we are connected to who are getting up and getting dressed and going to meet somewhere together and singing and receiving your word and embracing one another. God, thank you for the privilege of being in your church. Lord, there's so many people in this city who do not know you. And it's nothing in us that has earned the right to be your people. So Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy to awaken us to Jesus and to bring us into your church. Help us to be a church that equips. In Jesus' name, amen.